Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my hands-on first looks review of the Canon EOS R3. Yes, Canon not only let me touch their flagship mirrorless camera, but finally let me shoot with a pre-production model too, and have allowed me to share my results here. I have so much to show you, I'm splitting my R3 review into two separate videos. In this first one, I'll show you around the camera and controls, including the genuinely impressive eye control autofocus system, while in the second video, I'll take a deep dive into the photo and movie quality. I'll link to this second video here, and I'll also replace my initial pre-production results with one from a final sample when they're available. If you enjoy my reviews, please do consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks, now let's get on with it. Okay, here we go. The Canon EOS R3 is a high-end mirrorless camera aimed at pro sports and news photographers who demand the fastest speed and toughest body. Teased in April 2021 and officially launched six months later at 5,879 Great British Pounds, dollar price below, it's Canon's most powerful mirrorless camera to date. And while it outperforms the 1DX Mark III in most respects, it's officially positioned between it and the EOS R5, kind of implying that a 1-series mirrorless camera may come in the future. The R3 features Canon's first stacked backside illuminated full-frame sensor, and I've confirmed that it's designed and manufactured by Canon. To balance resolution, speed and noise, Canon's opted for 24.1 megapixels. Coincidentally, the same resolution that Sony chose for their first stacked full-frame sensor in the Alpha A9 three years ago. But Canon's sensor shoots 50% faster than the A9, supporting electronic bursts up to 30 frames per second with autofocus and auto exposure. So, the Canon R3 matches the top speed of the Sony Alpha 1, albeit capturing half the total pixels per frame. And here's how that sounds. When shooting at 30 frames per second, the R3's buffer can record up to 540 JPEGs or 140 RAW files, and unlike the R5 and R6 before it, there's no need to meet a bunch of conditions in order to achieve that green H plus icon on the screen. The battery has sufficient power that so long as you attach a sufficiently modern and compatible lens, the R3 will achieve that top speed. So that H plus icon is white all the time. And as you'll see in part two of my review, there's minimal skewing due to rolling shutter. Switch to the electronic first curtain or fully mechanical shutters and the top speed falls to 12 frames per second, but means you can now essentially keep shooting JPEGs or RAWs until you run out of memory. And here's how they sound respectively. Like the R5 and R6, the sensor's stabilised within the body and can work alongside lenses with optical IS to deliver up to 8 stops of compensation. Now this degree of compensation varies with the lens that you're using and I'll show you some examples in the second part of my review. In terms of exposures, the R3 offers a shutter speed range of 30 seconds to 8 thousandth of a second using the mechanical shutter and you can extend that to 64 thousandth of a second using the fully electronic shutter. That's faster than any electronic shutter that I've tested. At the other end of the scale, there's uh, the usual bulb timer that lets you easily dial in exposures starting at one second to one second shy of 100 hours. And there's an interval timer too. Meanwhile, the flash sync speed is 250th of a second with the electronic first curtain shutter, 200th of a second with the fully mechanical shutter, and then a first for Canon, you can now sync the flash with the fully electronic shutter at a speed of 180th of a second. Although you should also note that Sony also managed that with the Alpha 1 at a shutter speed of 200th of a second. Like the 1D series, the EOS R3 features a built-in portrait grip with duplicate controls, making it comfortable to hold and use whether shooting in the landscape or the portrait orientation. Although interestingly, it does lack that third strap lug of the 1DX that allows it to hang around your neck when turned for portraits. Amazingly, the R3 only becomes the third mirrorless camera with a built-in portrait grip following the Olympus EM1X and Fujifilm GFX100, although Nikon's upcoming Z9 also sports one. At first glance, the R3 unsurprisingly looks a lot like the EOS 1DX Mark III seen here, but in person it's more compact, roughly 1cm narrower, 2cm shorter, and almost a quarter of a kilogram lighter. Now don't get me wrong, it's still a substantial camera, but to me felt a lot more manageable than the 1DX Mark III, and something I'd be certainly a lot happier to carry around for long periods, especially when coupled with one of the lighter RF lens designs. 
It also feels as solid as a 1 series, with Canon claiming the same degree of dust and weather resistance, making it their toughest mirrorless camera to date. From the top, the R3 takes inspiration from both the 1DX Mark III and the EOS R5. On the right side, you'll find the same info screen as the R5, which can show two screens of information, with the choice of reversing the text and background colours. The main adjustments are performed by the front finger dial, thumb collar wheel, and the thumb wheel on the rear of the camera. Like the R5, you can change the exposure mode by pressing the mode button and turning a dial, but this time the switch between video and stills is using a dedicated collar control on the rear. Then on the upper left, the R3 takes inspiration from the 1 series, with two buttons working alongside the two top dials to adjust the drive and AF modes, metering and flash compensation, or after pushing both buttons on the left side, exposure bracketing, available here in 2, 3, 5 or 7 frames. Meanwhile, beneath the long sliding cover on the top, you'll find the new accessory shoe, which in addition to the standard 5 pins, now includes an additional 21 little ones under the front lip. This was first seen on the recently launched XF605 camcorder and provides communications and power to upcoming accessories. These include a new DME1D microphone that doesn't need an audio cable or its own battery, or the STE10 speedlight transmitter that's now smaller than before because it can now use the camera controls and menus. TIAC has also already announced the first third party accessory for the shoe with an XLR audio adapter. There is one small catch though, removing the hot shoe cover compromises the R3's full weatherproofing, but Canon's thought of that and also offers the ADE1 adapter that allows you to mount a speedlight flash gun to the R3 while maintaining a weatherproof seal. It would also be remiss of me not to mention that Sony has offered a similar multi-interface shoe for some years now, but at least Canon's now got one too. Unlike most new cameras, the R3 also includes a hardware GPS receiver, doing away with the need to pair the camera with your phone just to record your location. You can set it to periodically check its position or only when the camera is fully switched on. Here's the coordinates displayed during playback. From the rear, you'll see the R3 inherits some of the 1DX Mark III controls, including a similar power switch and that smart controller that made its debut on the flagship DSLR, and I'll show you how that works in just a moment. I'm also pleased to find the color control by the viewfinder to switch between stills and video, much less fiddly than toggling with the mode and info buttons on the R5. The shorter height of the R3 means there's no room for the secondary LCD status screen, which sat below the main monitor on the 1DX Mark III, and sadly none of the buttons on the R3 are backlit either, which to me feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. In terms of power, the R3 uses the same LPE19 battery pack as the 1DX Mark III, allowing owners of that DSLR to swap or share batteries. It's rated at 2700 mAh, so roughly one third more than the pack for the R5 and R6, but crucially it's higher voltage too, and that allows it to drive the autofocus systems of the recent RF Super Telephoto lenses a bit faster. Canon quotes up to 620 shots with the viewfinder, or 860 with the screen. If you mostly shoot bursts using the electronic shutter though, you're going to get a lot more pictures. On a single charge, I managed to get close to 2,000 photos and several minutes of slow motion 4K video as well. In terms of video alone, on a single charge, I managed to record a clip lasting 2 hours and 12 minutes in 4K 25p using IPB compression. And yes, you heard me correctly. That was a single 2 hour 12 minute clip. So the EOS R3 becomes Canon's first non-cinema camera to break that annoying half hour recording limit. And better still, I experienced no overheating issues. I'm going to talk way more about all of that in part 2 of this video. Behind a door on the grip side are the same dual card slots as the R5, so that means SD UHS 2 and CF Express Type B, and as you'd hope, the R3 allows simultaneous recording to both cards from day one. No firmware update needed here. There are a couple of high bitrate exceptions though. 4K video in all I at 50 to 120p is too much for SD cards at Canon's generous bit rates, as are all of the raw video options, but otherwise you can record anything to the SD card or to both cards simultaneously. And if you do opt for raw video, you can record it to the CF Express card along with an MP4 proxy to the SD. On the left side, you'll find the ports. 3.5mm microphone and headphone jacks, USB-C and HDMI, flash sync, and a gigabit ethernet port for wired networking. There's also 5GHz Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, as well as the GPS I mentioned earlier. 
The USB-C port runs at 3.2 Gen 2 speeds. It can charge the battery internally, and I successfully used my MacBook Pro and Samsung Galaxy S20 chargers. And it can now support Apple MFI certified connections to iPhones or iPads for third-party app support. Be interesting to see what people do with that. Annoyingly, despite the size of the body, Canon has doggedly stuck with a micro HDMI port on the R3 and it will output 4K in 10-bit 422 if desired. Now, at the time I made this review, there was no mention of outputting raw video over HDMI, but looking at the recent updates, I'd be very surprised if the R3 isn't squirting raw video in a 6K format to some sort of modified Ninja 5 Plus in the future. So watch this space. Composition is with either an electronic viewfinder or a screen. I filmed the EVF here, which shares the same 5.76 million dot panel as the R5, so that's 1600 by 1200 pixels with 076 times magnification. This does make it less detailed than the Alpha 1 viewfinder, but it still looks great in use and runs at either 60 frames per second in a power saving mode or 120 in a smooth mode. Like all EVFs, you can display a wealth of information, preview exposures and effects, navigate menus and playback images. When shooting fast bursts, there's no blackout or perceptible lag. The R3 also offers an optical viewfinder simulation, which doesn't preview the exposure if you prefer that look. Turning to the screen, the R3 employs a 3.2 inch panel with a higher than average 4.15 million dots for a more detailed image. Unlike the fixed screen on the 1DX Mark III, the R3 screen is fully articulated, flipping out to the side and twisting to almost any angle. Now, this is an interesting decision and only time will tell if it impacts the overall robustness, but as a fan of this type of screen, I'm not complaining personally. Moving on to autofocus, the R3 lets you choose between a wealth of areas from the full frame to three zones, single area with various expansion options and spot for precision. And the dual pixel CMOS system, which operates down to minus 70 V, is as fast, confident and accurate as you'd expect for a camera aimed at professional sports. But what makes the R3 stand out are the options for positioning the AF area. First of all, there's the AF joystick, which allows the usual eight directions and for me works best for small nudges rather than attempting to scroll across the frame. It's great for precision. Secondly, you can simply tap on the desired subject using the touchscreen. For me, this can be very quick, but depending on your steadiness and the size of your fingers, it may lack the precision of the joystick. Still great for pulling focus in movies though. Third is the smart controller, inherited from the 1DX Mark III. This allows the AF on button to double as a means to quickly adjust the AF area position. It employs optical technology, working a bit like an upside down computer mouse, but providing fast and surprisingly precise positioning of the AF area, especially when composing through the viewfinder. Now, all three techniques also work in playback, and here I'm using the smart controller to quickly scroll around an enlarged image. Like the 1DX Mark III, the joystick and smart controllers are also duplicated on the portrait grip. But the R3 goes above and beyond rival cameras by offering a fourth means and a rather unique means of adjusting the autofocus area and that is using eye control that you may have heard a bit about and I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes of this review talking all about it because it really is rather unique and very impressive in use. Now Canon first explored the idea of eye control for autofocus area selection on some film SLRs starting in the mid 90s with the EOS 5, a camera that I actually owned and I used to marvel at the ability ability to stare through one of those handful of uh, autofocus points and actually select it using my eye but it wasn't 100% reliable and even though it did become a bit more sophisticated on subsequent models it was always to me something that felt more of a novelty and Canon eventually stopped using it but it has now returned on the R3 and Canon has deployed all of its knowledge from its medical division to do something a lot more effective here. So it uses eight low power infrared LEDs around the viewfinder, four in a row at the top and four at the bottom to pretty accurately track the position of your eye. Now, crucially, it's not designed for you to actually track a subject by following it with your eye as it moves around the frame. It's designed instead for you to quickly and easily reposition an AF area on the subject that you want, after which you then tell the camera to use its AF algorithms to track it around. You'll first need to calibrate the system by looking through a target in the middle of the viewfinder while pressing the M function button. Once the system is happy with that, it'll repeat the process four more times, moving the target to the right, left, top and bottom. Now, sadly, I can't film the rest of this process though, as it requires your eye to the viewfinder. 
You can then repeat the process multiple times to refine the accuracy or when you're holding the camera in the portrait orientation. And in fact, Canon recommends that you do recalibrate the system when you turn up at a new venue. Now, this only takes about a minute, so it's not a great deal of inconvenience. And once you have calibrated it a couple of times, I found it was very, very accurate. Now, I'd love to show you the system working in practice, but it's actually very hard to capture it because you can only see it through the viewfinder when you have your eye pressed up against it. And that prevents me from filming through the viewfinder. It doesn't appear on the screen, so I can't film the screen. And unfortunately, the HDMI output is disabled when you're using the viewfinder, so I can't record that signal either. Canon did, however, let me use one of their demonstration videos. So I'm gonna be using that along with just describing how it works to you. After calibrating the system and the six banks so different people can use the camera, you'll see a little orange circle in the viewfinder with a smaller concentric orange circle in the middle. And this is the target that follows your eye. And the first thing you'll do is glance around the frame and see it moving around really quickly, but also very, very accurately. And it covers the entire area. You can look right into the corners. I found that when I calibrated the system once, it did kind of jump around a bit, but when I calibrated it twice to refine the accuracy, it became eerily good, almost like a video game. You found yourself testing the system, looking at a composition and actually glancing very accurately between two very close subjects like uh, antennas on top of uh, houses or even planks on a fence. And you could actually really effectively settle this little orange target wherever you wanted. And where this really comes into its own, I found, was when you're photographing team sports, when there could be maybe four or five or six players all in the frame at the same time. And the actual autofocus system will typically choose the closest person to you, but you might not want them, or maybe the action has moved to the other side of the frame. Well, all you need to do is glance over at the subject you want it to track, and you'll see that target move to it and you can use it to very accurately pick between faces and people on that frame. Then when the target is over the thing you want the camera to focus on, you just half press the shutter release or push the AF on button, and then that little orange target will disappear and the camera's autofocus system will take over using its cunning algorithms to track what it thinks is the subject that you're after. If it gets it wrong or the action moves to someone else, you just let go of the shutter or the AF on button, glance to where you want it to focus, half press or press the AF on button again, and it just takes over. And it is incredibly quick and precise in use. I've, I found it was an absolute game changer, not just for team sports, but also for street photography when you're not always certain where the subject is gonna come into the frame or if something more interesting is gonna happen somewhere else. And it just allows you to very quickly move that AF area absolutely or anywhere on the frame. A series of options lets you choose if the target should be visible all of the time, none of the time, or only prior to a shutter press, which is the default. You can also change the size, style, and color of the target, as well as storing up to six calibration banks for different people. I initially thought I might need to use a second bank when I'm using reading glasses, but the R3 proved accurate whether I wore them or not. Now, I'm sure the mileage will vary for different people, but if it works successfully for your eyes, you'll find this a real game changer, especially for team sports photography, and it gives the R3 a key advantage over rival models. I'm gonna wrap up this first video now, and as I said at the start, I'm gonna leave the photo and video quality results to part two, which I'll link to here. So please do check it out, it continues this story. So the EOS R3 is Canon's most powerful and impressive camera to date, exuding sheer confidence. Sure, it's numerically positioned below the 1DX Mark III and undercuts it on price too, but it couples all of the company's latest technology and ergonomic heritage to simply become one of its best yet. I know some photographers still prefer optical viewfinders and may not approve of the flip screen, but I'd choose the R3 over the 1DX every single time. But equally, be in no doubt the EOS R3 is a specialist tool aimed at a specialist audience. Sure, anyone can have fun with the eye control and firing off fast bursts with a camera that feels bulletproof, but this is not aimed at the mainstream or even enthusiast markets. They've got the R5 and the R6 for that. The R3 is for pro sports and news gathering, and Canon doesn't even mention wildlife in the press release. So it's important to take the design and specifications in context. 24 megapixels is more than enough for pro sports, and Canon was right to design the body and autofocus system around their exact needs. 
If I had to choose one Canon body for my own personal needs, it would be the R5, but if I were a pro sports photographer, the R3 would jump straight to the top. I'm looking forward to comparing it side by side with Nikon's upcoming Z9, which is another specialist tool, along with the Sony Alpha 1, which is more of an all-rounder. So which one would you buy? Let me know in the comments and please do check out part 2 of my review concentrating on the R3's photo and video quality along with a bunch of autofocus tests. Before you go though, please make sure you're subscribed if you like what I do and as always if you find any of it valuable, don't forget to like or even treat me to a coffee. Cheers and thanks for watching. Now get over to part 2.